Okay, uh, like I mentioned, my name is John Williams. I'm, I'm going to lead the seminar this morning. And the way that I like to do this, I have a lot of information. I've, I have, I'm pretty prepared. And I think you'll, you'll get a lot out of this. However, if you are not hearing the one thing that you need to know, just tell, ask me. And uh, we can stop. We can diverge and come back to the middle or whatever. So don't be afraid to ask a question as we go along. Uh, just put up your hand and we'll, and we'll just take questions as we go. Okay? So today we're going to talk about the Buffalo River, which is America's first national river. So in 1972, the Buffalo was designated as a national river, and then it later became a, a national park. So the, the thing, one of the things that's really unique about the Buffalo is that it's a national park on both sides of the river for the entire length of the river. Okay, so what does that mean to you? How many, how many rivers have you paddled and then you see a camp and a dock and a... And, you know, when you do the buffalo, it's nothing but woods and bridges, okay? No camps, no docks, no, uh, it's a complete linear national park for 135 miles. What an asset. And in case you didn't know, dating back even to the 1800s, they had planned to dam up the buffalo and turn it into Bull Shoals Lake, you know, the equivalent of Bull Shoals Lake. And uh, in the 1970s, 60s and 70s, uh, a group of people sort of banded together called the Ozark Society, which, by the way, are the people who wrote this book. And uh, they created a decade-long fight to prevent the damming of the river and to save it as a national river. So we would most definitely not have this river to float now if we didn't have those people back then who fought to set that aside as in its natural state. So what, is, what does natural state mean? Well, one of the things it means is that the river is completely uncontrolled as far as floods. So one of the things that's unique about the buffalo, if it rains a lot, river's coming up. And I mean, it can, it'll, it can rise 20 feet in one day. I mean, it can flood. I was there four years ago when it said it's going to make a major career. Yeah, it it's exactly right. So uh, it can drop off, but it's, it's a completely natural flowing river, undammed. Um, so uh, it means that there's no civilization along there. So, you know, you're completely on your own. Um, there is, uh, but as far as camping, I, I don't know if there's a better camping, canoeing camping river available anywhere in the country. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there might be some, but I can't think of another national park that's 135 miles long with the river being at its center. So that, that is what, what you're looking at when you, when you talk about the buffalo. Uh, it's, a not, it's about an eight, eight or nine hour drive, depending on where you're going. So it's a little far, but it's not super far. You can easily go there in a day. And uh, you can take trips from anywhere from a day trip to doing the entire river in one fell swoop, which, you know, I would plan that for maybe eight days, eight or nine days to do if you wanted to do the entire river. So, and everything in between. So there's, uh, it, it is not really, I would not call it a whitewater river. Uh, we asked about the, how difficult the rapids were on the upper, the upper section's a little more rapidy but the heaviest rapids are class three, they call them class three, but they're really kind of class two rapids. So the river doesn't have heavy rapids, so you don't need a big whitewater skill level to float any of this. Um, there is, I have some slides in here on the main skill that you need to know to stay out of trouble on the river. But uh, it's easy to do, simple to do, and uh, it's accessible to anybody. You know, you don't have to go take a week of whitewater training, you know, to go on this. So I think that's what's so cool about it. So I'm gonna show you the first few so slides I'm gonna show you are, oh, I should have gone to this. The, um, 
Let me just run back through it. First National River, 135 miles in length, established in 1972. The bluffs are spectacular. The camping's unbelievable. The fishing, it is, it's good. <laughs> And it can be great. And I've seen people catch big fish out of there. I haven't, but I've seen people do it. Um, no docks, no private land, no camps. It's a true wilderness experience. And that's not easy to find. No hunting? No hunting. Okay. Nope. No hunting. So uh, the thing, and I wish this showed better, but some of these with the light we have is a little tough, but the, um, oh, Christina, that, that, um, so when you're on the river, one of the big features of the river is these uh, gravel bars that you'll see on the left with a bluff on the right or vice versa. So beautiful, beautiful camping. Uh, I think it's really a family experience you know, because of the gentle nature of the water and the fact that it's not heavy white water, you can take even little kids. So that's Becky with our grandson. This is our son and his wife last summer when we went uh, with uh, our grandson. This is this bottom right one is just a picture of us hanging out under a tarp. Um, this is my 12 year old grandson with his friend and you can see these little riffles. This is kind of the white water. Yeah. And honestly, the, the, the little rapids, what people would call rapids, are not the trouble spot that you need to watch for on this river. I'm going to cover that in a minute. Uh, all right. Uh, you can see the camping here, just big, flat, wide, nice gravel bars. People are like, oh, gravel. I don't want to sleep on gravel. Gravel is the best thing for camping on much better than sand because you're not dragging sand into your tent. Now you have to cope with it with a, one piece of special gear, which I'll get to in a minute. And uh, you have to have a good pad, but camping on gravel is great. So this is all gravel. That's the kind of fish that I catch <laughs> right there. Yeah, there, but you can catch plenty of them. I think uh, one day uh, last summer, uh, Almost every day, Becky probably caught 50 or 60 of these with a fly rod just floating down the river. Cool. You, can, you can catch tons of brim. Uh, there is smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, other fish to catch. But um, there, are, there have been trips where we've caught smallmouth bass, but it's just like I don't really have it figured out. So I can't consistently catch them, but other people can. Um, the buffalo, for me, and other people is about, not about like freeze dried food, it's about bringing nice food. So you can free, like we bring, we might freeze a bag of gumbo and we'll have one cooler that's frozen food. Our last trip was six days and we had frozen food the entire way through because we had one cooler for frozen food for the whole group. And the only time we opened it during the day was to grab one thing out and shut it. So that you can bring nice food you can see how we flip our canoe upside down and use it as a table to set up and you can cook. We, we brought a Dutch oven, you know, you can, make, you can cook well and enjoy, enjoy your time. I suppose you need the Arkansas Fishing License, things like yeah. that. Yeah, you do, you do. And you can get that online. And uh, I just wanted to say it can be a generational family experience. This is a picture, I think in 1978, I think that that's me in the background for whatever that's worth. That's my mom and this is my brother, Doug. And um, so that's, I just was trying to dig up an old picture and that's what we used in the old days, those old uh, Grumman aluminum canoes. And this is a picture of me with our son, Matt, when he was, he's now 37 years old, but he grew up going there. Our family, I think when I was, even from the time, I think it started when I was in first grade. The day we got out of school, we would all get in our big old station wagon, we'd go to the Buffalo River. And we did every year. Our family went every year for almost 50 years. And so, um, I know some of these pictures don't show, but uh, you, you get these foggy mornings that are fantastic. Uh, there's side hikes up creeks. You can see this little creek right here. That's a side hike up a creek. Beautiful hiking. And 
Lastly, this past summer, it's kind of this thing where the first year that you do a 50 miler, you know, we just make a big deal out of it. So this was the first year that our grandson did a 50 miler. And so that's him on the left with his buddy that he did it with. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna get into it. Y'all ready? All right, so we're gonna talk about three main sections of the river, the upper, the middle, and the lower. They're all the same, but they're, they're, they have some different tendencies to them. So the first section called the upper river is Ponca or Boxley to Pruitt. All right, and let me hit one more. Okay, so this is what we're calling the upper. And in general, even though it says Boxley and you can float from Boxley, Boxley is hard to float from because it's very seldom there's enough water in the river to float from Boxley to Pruitt. For most people, uh, I mean Boxley to Ponca, for most people, floating the upper section is Ponca all the way down to Pruitt. That's what a lot of people call the upper section. I went, I took it all the way to uh, basically to Carver or Hasty. So the upper section has a steeper gradient. Gradient means the amount of drop per mile. So it's a little bit steeper gradient, which means there's a few more rapids but there's also less long pools. So the Buffalo River is a drop pool river. So you'll go through a little riffle and then, then you have to paddle through a pool. The bad thing is you have to paddle through the pool. The good thing is uh, if you flipped over in the riffle, you can get all your act back together before you get to the next rapid. So even in the upper section, it's drop pool. It's just steeper. Is it hard? No, but it is, and this will answer your question on the difficulty. It's good solid class two. Some, some books you'll read will call it class three. There's two main rapids on the upper section, one called Gray Rock, and the other one menacingly named Wrecking Rock. Okay, and they're both very easy to run. And this is the, the trick is all, almost all the rapids on the Buffalo are on turns and the obstacles tend to be in the outside of the turn, which is where the water is pushing you. So if you control yourself and stay on the inside of the turn, you will have, you'll be like, That's, that was a rapid, you know, it's not hard. But if you're not paying attention and you end up in the outer section and then you're getting pushed into a rock, then it feels like a real rapid. So that's your answer, uh, best I can give it. Um, bluffs are super high. There's some really good hiking. The Buffalo River Trail is in that section. Um, Goat Bluff and Hemden Hollow are like world-class hikes. Uh, again, Hemden Hollow is the highest waterfall east of the Rockies. Are those rivers marked, like the, the waterfalls? No. No, that's where this book comes in. And I'm going to talk about that, how you use this book when you're on the river. But as you, and I'll just talk about it right now. When you're on the river, usually one person gets in the group, stays responsible. So the unique thing about this book is it's got uh, topographic maps. So you just say, you see this, you see this right here? I know it might be hard to see it, but you see how there's a creek coming in from the side here and down here? So as we're going down the river, one person has this out, maybe in their lap, and they're like, oh, we're gonna have a hard right turn. When we get to that hard right turn, we're gonna look at the book again. And then there should be a creek coming in from the right. Oh, there's that creek coming in from the right. So all the way down, you're keeping track of where you are. And I've talked to people who've gone to the Buffalo and they said, yeah, we got on the Buffalo and we were gonna camp for three days and Halfway through the second day, we ended up at the takeout. <laughs> okay, well, you know, that you, you have to keep track of where you are and, and make sure that you stop where you want to stop and make sure, you know, that you know that the rapid, that rapid is coming up or, you, or that 
the creek that takes you to Hemnan Hollow is on the left. Okay, that's going to be the next creek on the left. Let's all be looking for that creek. Okay, let's pull over the creek. Now we're going to hike up the creek. Oh, there's Hemnan Hollow. That's how you find things on the buffalo, is that it is not marked, but what they leave it for you as an adventure to find it. Okay? So that's, and along with the map, the next page will have a pretty detailed written description and some historical stuff about, about the area, but mainly it'll say like Rort Bluff. The bluff on the left is the longest on the river. N numerous pour-offs or waterfalls after a heavy rain. Blah, blah, blah. You know, there's just interesting stuff in the book to keep you on track and know where you're at. So very important to use this as you go along. So here's the thing about uh, the upper section. This is where all the college students go to have fun and go through the rapids and drink beer and all that. And I want to pigeonhole college students because believe me, it's a lot more than college students that like to do that. So it, there are more people in this section. I would suggest that if you're going to do the upper, I, I like to do the upper at Easter okay uh, because nobody's floating the river at Easter this year Easter is super early so maybe not this year but in other words don't go on Memorial Day weekend and float the upper section it will be you know unfathomable it wouldn't be fun uh, also go on weekdays yes no glass allowed on the river that's a great point I'm glad you said that uh, they do not allow you to bring glass on the river. So if, you, if you're bringing something that has glass, you've got to repackage it before you get on the river. Um, so I love the upper. We don't float the upper often because we're floating with kids and we're, wanting, we're more looking for a camping experience and we want to have less people. You know, having less people is important to us. The camping areas, like the, the gravel bars are smaller. So like if you got, if you're on the middle or lower and you got to a gravel bar and someone was camping there, well, you could probably camp on the other end and no one would even know you're there. But on the upper, it's a gravel bar. So if somebody's in the spot you planned on, you got to go to the next spot. So I, you know, for us, for what we're doing right now, it, uh, we, we would prefer to go on the middle or lower. But I would encourage you to do the upper because uh, the upper has the more white water and it has the hikes to the bluffs and to Hemnan Hollow. So let me show you a couple pictures. Oh, here's, here's a blow up of that section. I should have gone to that. So are you saying um, the take-ins are not um, labeled or signed? No, okay. they're not. Okay. In other words, so what I'm looking at, if, I'm, if I was looking at this book and I was trying to find a place to camp out uh, I would be looking, see here's a gray rock, big bluff. They have a few things marked. Let me get something to put point with. Okay, so here's Ponca. You know, the first day, anywhere there's a bend, usually on the outside of the bend is a bluff. You see how big bluffs on the outside of this bend? Well, you can pretty much guarantee this is going to be a gravel bar. Okay, the inside of the bend is generally a gravel bar. And when you look at the map, y'all can pass that map back around so y'all can all look at it again. You can look at the, ma at, the, uh, at the bluff will be, are y'all familiar with reading topographical maps? So when the topo lines are close together, it's a cliff. When they're far apart, it's flat. So we're looking for a flat section with a bluff across the river. I want to make one point because I'm looking at this. Sometimes you'll have a bluff, say this bluff, and you'll have a gravel bar in front of it. Okay, that is not a, that is not a safe place to camp. Okay, because what you want to think about when you pick a campsite on the Buffalo is the fact that the river can rise many feet in one night. Okay, so if, it, if the river starts rising, you want to be able to take down your tent, walk up to higher ground, set your tent back up. Okay, you don't want to have a bluff at your back. 
and you don't want to be camping on an island, right? Because if the water comes up and it's night, you're, you're in a bad spot. That's one of the key things, yes. Is that a bluff? Is like a, a sheer wall of, of rock? Is that, is that what a bluff yes. is? A bluff is a cliff, a yes. Cliff. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to have a bluff at your back. Right. You, because that, that would prevent, prevent you from seeking higher ground. Okay. Correct. And generally, on the buffalo, there'll be a bluff on one side, and on the other side of the river is usually a gravel bar. That's normally. But sometimes you have both. Okay. So... Here's Ponca. Box lead Ponca is generally, you got to time it. Like it's raining, we got to be there today. That's almost the only way you're going to float box lead to Ponca. Ponca to Pruitt is 23 miles. One of the great things about this book is at the beginning, you see this chart? If, I, if I'm starting at Ponca, I can go across to Pruitt and see that it's 28.7 miles. So it's very easy to tell how far it is between uh, take out and put in. Uh, in general, we like to do 10 to 15 miles per day. That's a comfortable, usually a group will move at two to three miles an hour. So if you're talking about 15 miles, you, you're talking about five hours on the river, including breaks. So if you start at nine, you'll be at camp at two or three. So that's, that's easy. So, and if you're a fast group, you could plan on more miles. If you have kids and you want to stop a lot and float down the river with your life jackets, you might want to plan a little bit less mileage. Okay. Question, excuse me. Mm -hmm. You keep saying Ponca to Boxley. Shouldn't it be Boxley to Ponca, the way the river's flowing? Yeah, Boxley it? to Ponca. Okay, got it. Yes, I, if I said that wrong, I sorry about that, but uh, it's definitely Boxley to Ponca. So Ponca to Pruitt is a well-known upper section run. And uh, let me show you a few pictures of it. Whoops. Um, this is what a lot of the riffles just look like this. Just very simple. We call them haystacks, just bobbing up and down in the river. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like. This is a picture from up on Goat Bluff. So you can hike. One of the better hikes is to start at the uh, creek that, that comes from Hemden Hollow and hike up. And you can. there's a way that you can connect to a trail to come up to Goat Bluff from Hemden Hollow. And... Here's him in hollow. In case you don't get there, this is what it looks like. And uh, just a couple other pictures, like, you know, the morning when the, when the uh, mist is coming up off the river is just fantastic. Okay, any questions on the upper section? Um, you'll probably cover this a little bit later, but shuttle services. How do you get, when you go in one vehicle mm -hmm. and you, you start here, Yes. So how do you get either back to your car or sure. do you have a, a spot for that later? Yes, I do have a spot okay, for that, well, but we'll talk about it then. no, we'll get, let me just talk about it real quick and I'll get to it in more detail later. You, when you're doing a section, you're doing any of this, you do have to get either run your own shuttle if you have two cars or you have to hire someone to do a shuttle for you. Or if you're renting a boat up there, which honestly is something you should definitely think about, um, they include the shuttle with it. So, before you decide to haul your boat all the way to the Buffalo, check the price of the rental of the boat versus bring your own. We always bring our own because we like to take our own boats. But the uh, And if you're on the river multiple days, it's probably worth bringing your own boat. If you're going for one day, it might be simpler just to rent a boat up there. But the uh, shuttle services are easy to figure out, and uh, they do it a couple of different ways, which I'll get to in a minute. Yes? Uh, Any what? You just go old school. <laughs> you just hope for the best. Like you look at the long-term forecast and you make your best guess. I have a section up here a little further in where I'm going to talk about how to read the gauge 
the USGS water gauge and things to think about with that. But, you know, to some degree, things happen and you, you just have to cope with it. And there is cell service in a few spots, but in general, I would not count on having almost no cell reception on the entire river. So you can't run gravel bar and get there because it sticks to the edge of the water when you get there, right? Absolutely. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. I'm gonna and I'll get to that too. So as far as the section, this section, any questions about this section? What was the key information about uh, Hamden Hollow? It's the highest, you said waterfall? Yes, the highest waterfall in the river and I think the highest east of the Rockies. Okay. Or maybe between the Rockies and the Appalachians or something like that. But it's a very long story short, very high, very impressive, beautiful waterfall. Very quickly, how, how long will we need to give ourselves? Let's say we, we set up camp, um, arrive at our, at our gravel area called, I think Jim's Bluff is what I was told, right? right? Okay. How far of a hike would it be from there to like the, the Hendon Hollow? Well, it depends. You'll have to read your book, okay, the book. Okay. study the book. And like Hemden Hollow in general, when we've done it, we've done it as a lunch spot because there isn't, there, the, the camping area there, it's not super convenient to you know, like there's not great camping at where you walk up mm -hmm. there's not a gravel bar right there uh, there is one I think across but I, my memory of it is it wasn't that great so we've always done Hemden Hollow as a lunch stop okay. yes is it okay to leave your canoe and all your gear there just make sure you haven't disturbed it is it oh yeah for sure he, yeah he asked if is it okay to leave your canoe there if you walk away um I mean, maybe you should take something with you. I don't know, but you, but in general, yeah, you can leave your stuff and not worry about it. We do. And so are there areas where, say, you, you know, you, you've had a nice little run and you'd like to do it again? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Are there areas you can yeah, you, it, you know, back up? Or oh, sure. And just, okay. Yeah, you can do that. I mean, if you want to, uh, you could, like, come through the rapid and get in the eddy and paddle back up the eddy and then drag up and float it again. Or, you know, what a lot of, what we do, especially when we have kids, what they like to do is just put on their life jackets and walk up and float down. And they'll do that for an hour or hours at the campsite and have fun doing that. And yeah, you can definitely do that. Okay, so the middle section runs from Carver all the way to the Highway 14 bridge. So I'm gonna just zoom in on it a little bit. So here's Carver. I'm gonna point out another main intersection right here is the Highway 65 bridge, which you will be driving up if you're coming from Lafayette and you're doing the middle section. Gilbert which we use these people to do shuttles quite a bit. There's also people up here on this side of Highway 65 that we use to do shuttles. And then here's the Highway 14 bridge down here. Um, a good three day, three to four day that we do is Carver to Gilbert. Or Mount Hersey to Gilbert is a good, probably three day trip, maybe four day if you want to take your time. Another one that's a little bit longer is to do this whole section from Carver all the way to the Highway 14 bridge. Uh, but, in ge but generally that will end up making you have to have two shuttles. Meaning like if we, here's how, and let's talk shuttles again. If we were gonna do that section from Carver to Highway 14, we would drive to Gilbert and we would have them, uh, we would tell them, hey, we're gonna put in at Carver. We would arrange this ahead of time, by the way. We, we're gonna go to Carver and we want you to go up and bring our cars back to Gilbert, okay? So what they would do is we drive up with them and they would bring drivers and they would drive our car and leave it in Gilbert for the time, whole time we're on the river. <coughs> and then 
they would go and deliver our cars the day before we get to Highway 14. They would deliver them at <coughs> Highway 14. Now we're not we're talking about a you know a serious amount of money here. So we to do that, you might spend like three hundred dollars to do that to do that double shuttle. So just be prepared mentally for that. And how long how long that trip from Harvard? Uh, five days. Five. Yep, I'll, I'll give you. Again, like coming back to this chart, just so you can look over my shoulder. Uh, here's Carver. Okay. And then going across, Highway 14 is 57.4 miles. So, you know, five days, only 10 miles a day. So you could definitely do it in five days. Or you could do it like I have a, sh a short day on the first day and the last day and have five days. But the first day and the last day are kind of short days. Doable. If you do it that way, if you meet the problem, you need to supply with you. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You need to supply the back of your car. Absolutely. And that's a great, I'm glad you brought that up, Tom. Um, because what you can do here is leave stuff in your car and because knowing that you're going to pass Gilbert and you can pick up some additional food or whatever or you could re-up your ice when you get to Gilbert and that's a nice thing to do. Uh, so let me point out a couple of campsites that are really good. Um, okay I'm going to show you some pictures in a minute but you see this spot here called the NARS the Narrows. Okay. And you see Woolham right here? All right. When you come around past Skull Bluff, there's going to be a big gravel bar on your right, and you can camp right here between Skull Bluff and Woolham. And then you can make a hike up to the Narrows. Let me go forward and show you this. This is the Narrows, or the Nars, as they call it in Arkansas. <laughs> so what it is, you, you come up, this is the river, mm -hmm. but way down past the Nars, you can get on a dirt road and walk up the dirt road and come up the backside and walk across the Narrows and then walk back and go back where you came from. But it's just a neat place to see. And if you study some of these things online, you can figure out exactly where to camp and what to do to do it. But uh, I would definitely, definitely recommend that as one of one of my stops. A lot of times, we'll put in, we'll put in at uh, Carver and just go a little bit. Like we'll get in in the afternoon, and then uh, the first day we'll float down to. I wish Becky was here; she would tell us exactly what the name of these bluffs. Um, the NARS is, it's a, it's, it's a fantastic hike. Um, but we camp here, and then uh, the next day we go to a bluff called McRaven Bluff. Don't push this with a lot of people. <laughs> There's almost never someone camping there, and it's the most, one of the most beautiful bluffs on the entire river. And uh, thanks. So. Uh, going back to the, the NARS, your spot on the book is called Benton Bluff. Benton, B-E-N-T-O-N. So we camp at Benton Bluff, and then we also the next day is a long day. It's a 15-mile day, but we will camp at McRaven Bluff. Okay. And then one of the tricks with these books, when you get home, you have to pull the pages apart and make sure they don't get stuck. Okay, so uh, at 68.4 is McRaven Bluff. That's our next campsite. Then the next day, we're going to float down from McRaven. I don't know exactly where that is on the map, but we're going to float down from McRaven. We're going to stop at Gilbert, get a popsicle or whatever, and here's the next awesome bluff and awesome camping spot is 
Red Bluff. Now, I'll tell you that if you go to Gilbert, I think they run St. Joe to Gilbert for day trips. So there's uh, day trip options. There's cabins at Gilbert, too, that they rent. Um, so going, going here uh, is a great spot to go. Red Bluff is our next campsite. And then, um, let me see if I have a picture of it. Look, how, look at the size of those bluffs. Okay, there's the NARS. I mean, is that awesome or what? Okay, now this, this is the Spring Creek gravel bar. Spring Creek is on river right. And uh, that, remember earlier in the slideshow when you saw the people walking up the side creek? That's Spring Creek. Fantastic side hike. Highly recommend, highly recommend that side hike at Spring Creek. Um, it spring, and also, I can't explain how to do it, but if you go up that creek far enough, there is a cave on the left, okay? And it's past, it, like you're on the creek, and it kind of branches, and you stay left, and keep looking, and you'll see where people go up and over. There's a cave up there. So uh, Spring Creek, sometimes we'll go and stay two days at Spring Creek. Okay, so this is Skull Bluff. If you get the right water, you see the eyes and the nose. If you get the right water level, which has to be a certain water level, you can, pat, you can paddle through the eyes. And so let me, uh, let me go back to the map. Okay, so going back, we put in at Carver, we just picked a site somewhere along the way, depending on how late we get into the water. Uh, we camp out at Benton Bluff and we hike the NARS. Then we camp out at McRaven Bluff. Uh, sometimes there's a rope swing across the river, sometimes there's not. Um, then we resupply at Gilbert and keep going and we camp at Red Bluff. Then we camp at Spring Creek Bluff and then you're only five miles from Highway 14 Bridge where you take out early enough to drive all the way home. What's the fourth one again? Spring Creek Bluff. How far yeah. is it from Gilbert to Buffalo Point? I'll be camping at Buffalo Point next. Oh, time. Buffalo Point is, uh, is oh, it's a little ways past Highway 14. So is that just a one night or it would be a two night? Be from where to where? From Gilbert? Gilbert to Buffalo Point? Oh no, it'd be, it'd be longer than that. It'd be longer than that? Yeah. It'll, it'll be, uh, let me see if I can tell you. So from, let's say, Gilbert, going to uh, Buffalo Point. Oh, it's not that far. It's 23 miles. So I could do it in one night or two nights? Oh, you could do it in one night. Yeah. You could do one night camping. And yeah, and get out at so Buffalo we're, Point. We're going up there to Okay. Yeah. One thing that I like to do is when you know kind of what you want to do, the section of the river you want to be on, and you choose whoever you're going to do your shuttle with, say, hey, I'm thinking about doing Gilbert to Buffalo Point. And they'd say, okay, we can do that. It's a $300 shuttle, but if you take out at Maumee South, it's a $125 shuttle. Yeah. And it's only, it's only, you know, for whatever reason, like maybe they don't like shuttling into the park, into the main park. But, but anyway, yeah, I think that's a great option. I don't know. You'd look, you try to find a spot because you know, sometimes we put in at noon, sometimes we put in at four, you know, and so we just try to find a good gravel bar with an escape route. Yeah. And the second is Skull Bluff. Yeah, it's Benton Bluff. Benton Bluff. Yeah. If it, if it takes eight, nine hours to get there from here, where do you, where would you stay the first night before you get on the river? Well, I mean, you could drive from Lafayette and put on the river if you, if you wanted to, but that's a long day. So we've done that before, but what we do now is we'll, we drive maybe four or five hours and, you know, get just south of Little Rock and stay somewhere and then drive up that morning. And keep in mind, it takes a little while to check in with the 
person that's doing your shuttle, that whole thing takes some time to run the shuttle. So don't forget about that. So the first leg is just any leg? Yeah, I don't have a specific spot for you. And the second leg is just golf bluff or bent and bluff? Well, it's bent and bluff, which is a little past skull bluff. Also, uh, the river changes, and I know the first thing Becky's going to say is, man, camping at Benton Bluff isn't that great anymore. Well, it's, I mean, it's not as good as it used to be, but it's still pretty good, and you can still go and hike the NARS. So, the, because sometimes gravel bars that were there five years ago have eroded, and they're much smaller now, which is the case at Benton Bluff. But, so, you know, you have to, you got got to, take this information and roll with it because the r river is constantly changing, but not massively. Okay, so that's, that's your middle section. Great thing about the middle section, a lot less people. Um, I still like weekdays. If you can do weekdays, you're much better off than weekends. And, uh, you know, the middle section's fantastic. Okay, run through these pictures. Okay, now, Highway 14 to the White River, or what we call the lower section. The lower section is a section that we had not really done that often, and, uh, but we have done it, and I think this is what we used to do when I was a little kid, but, the, but, now, but in the modern era, we always did the middle section. Last year, we had really low water, which I'm about to talk about after we finish with this, this part. We had really low water, so we were forced to do the lower section. So this is, this is the lower, what they call the lower section. The nice thing about the lower section is mainly after you get past Buffalo Point. Buffalo Point is the main national park center. Okay, that's where all the big national park buildings and all that is. It's also can be where all the craziness is. Now keep in mind last year, because of our family, we had to go and do, um, we had to do uh, Memorial Day weekend. So <laughs> take it with a grain of salt, but we went, we went all the way from Gilbert to the White River on that trip. And because uh, we wanted to do six days and we wanted to do 50 miles on the 50th year of the Buffalo River. So we, that's what we did. And it was our grandson's first 50 miler and all that. So we did, that's what we did. And it was awesome starting at Gilbert. You know, we did, we did Red Bluff, we did Spring Creek. And then once we got past between Highway 14 and Buffalo Point, I'm gonna tell you there was a lot of people, a whole lot of people. Like, and then as we got closer to Buffalo Point, it was crazy. Like the amount of people at Buffalo Point was crazy. Like there was churches out there baptizing people in the water. There was people in inner tubes. There was people like it was like we had, and we had been like camping for three days. So then we were coming into all the, like this insane number of people. But once we got past Buffalo Point, nobody, nobody. <laughs> and it was gorgeous. This section is what they call the wilderness area because there's no access and after you get past, I think Rush, and I think there might've been a, you know, a fair amount of people even from Buffalo Point to Rush, but after Rush, nobody. So don't discount doing Rush to the White River, as a, especially on a low water trip. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to like tell you the exact great greatest campsites because there is a million there's so many great campsites on that lower section uh, lots and lots of gravel bars lots of huge bluffs surprising number of rapids it's not just flat water we had this idea that oh the lower section just all flat water no it had nice riffles good great camping no people it was it was awesome so we're definitely putting this lower section into our thought pattern going forward especially on low water which we're going about in a minute. So, yes. About how many days would you say from Buffalo Point to Buffalo <coughs> City where it wraps up? Yeah. So, uh, so Buffalo Point to Rush 
is 23.6. <coughs> and that's one night, but that's rush. Now let's see. Oh, we didn't do a good job getting our book dried out. One night you got to rush for rush. <laughs> see, uh, 130.7 is the White River. And rush is at 107. So if you go all the way to the White River from, where did you say, Rush? From Buffalo. Oh, from Buffalo Point? 130.7. OK. OK, so from Buffalo Point, you're talking about Buffalo Point to the White River is 31 miles. So I, you know, for me, I'd probably take three days to do that. You could do it in two, though. But you, but you might work. It might be some work. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, the big thing that I wanted to impress on everybody for this section is knowing that from Highway 14 to Rush has a lot of people, especially this section around Buffalo Point. After Rush, there's nobody down here, and it's a beautiful section. So don't discount that. Keep that as an option for, for your uh, fit for your paddling trips. Um, we caught tons of fish. We did not catch this fish on that section. <laughs> I just put that as a picture for what you could catch <laughs> if you were knew, knew better. But, like, you know, it wasn't flat water. There was a lot of moving water. And I'm telling you, we had very, very low water on that trip, super low water. It was too low, too low. You literally could not put in it, Carver. Uh, you could not float that section, that middle section. It was too low. So keep it in mind. Beautiful camping. Uh, there's some flat water sections, but they weren't weren't bad at all. And uh, that's it. So that's the talk about the sections. And we can come back to that. I'm going to go ahead and move into gear. And then at the end, if you have more questions about, sec about the sections, where to camp, where to float, or whatever, we can talk about that a little more. So I've already talked about the book. And I don't think I need to expand on that, but this is a great book to have, and it's a great book to keep. And like I told you, that book that we pass around, that's like, these are my mom's notes right here. Good small campsite at Maine's Bluff at 59.7. Having that, having that book and having it in your lap as you go down the river and saying, man, I never thought about camping there, but I'm going to write that down for next year because you never know you know, maybe if this spot's full and you can't camp there and you look at your book and say, oh, yeah, I made a note. We Three miles down, there's another gravel bar on the left, so we're just going to go there. Okay, so it's good to have that. Okay, next. All right, we're going to talk about things that are important on the buffalo and things you need to know about, about the river. River rise. We've already talked about that a bit, but the river can rise a lot, and that can cause problems. Two things. Tom mentioned this. Number one, every time you get on the, you stop at a campsite, you should put a stick in, like just bang a stick in at the water edge so you can see, keep an eye during the afternoon and the evening on whether the river is rising or falling. Um, the river can rise even if it doesn't rain on you. Ask me how I know. <laughs> one time, I won't get into it, but one time we had uh, four canoes float away in the middle of the night. <laughs> Don't forget, no cell phone service. We got out of it. <laughs> okay, the uh, river can rise many feet in a few hours. Okay. So that's the main thing. Watch your weather, get your long-term weather forecast. I'm gonna show you the river gauge in a minute, how to read it and what to look for. Uh, watch for heat, cold and weather situations. The river, it can be super hot up there. I think it's hotter there than here. Um, so keep in mind that 
bring plenty of water. I really, we bring a group tarp, a big tarp to set up. And we set that, when we get to a campsite, that's the first thing we set up is our, our group tarp. And, you know, we'll, the kid, if it's hot in the afternoon, you can get under it and drink water, or whatever you're gonna do. So it's nice to have a tarp. Um, the river can also be very, very cold. We've had some really cold trips there, even ice and snow on that on the river. So, you know, just just like any camping trip, just be prepared for whatever the weather situation is. In case of thunderstorms, get off the river. I will say this: if you're into studying lightning, look up National Outdoor Leadership School lightning. Google that. NOLS, Knowles Lightning Instruction or whatever. They've done a lot of research. Nobody really knows exactly what the best things to do are with lightning, but I do know that you don't want to be at the base of a bluff because lightning can hit a bluff and go straight down the bluff. So you don't want to be like in a cave under a bluff. Uh, I do know that. I think you generally want to be kind of in a little bit more open area, not near the highest tree, not up against a bluff. But I, I want to leave it to you to study lightning and make your own decisions on what to do with that. Uh, we've had trips where we just kept paddling right through lightning storms. And so um, I don't really know. So that's, that's lightning. Uh, in general, you'll want to take shelter, and there is a lightning defense position that Knowles has developed if it got super bad, but I, I wouldn't worry about it too much, but it's good to know what would I do if it was, if we get in a lightning storm or on the river, what are we going to do? We're going to pull off, we're going to get our pads out, and we're going to all get in the lightning defense position 12 feet apart from each other. That I know is the most safe thing to do but then sometimes you just can't do the most safe thing because of other things. So what I will say is just make your plan and know what your plan is and then work your plan when you're in the middle of it. Watch your river level, which I'm gonna get to in a minute. Selecting a site, we've already talked about that, but I'm gonna talk about it again. Always, the first thing you do when you get to a site, if you're not used to it, is you walk around, you get out of the boat, you, walk, you tell everyone, hey, we may or may not camp here, don't get your heart set on it. <laughs> And then you walk up and you see if there's an escape route. You want to be able to get at least 10 to 20 feet higher than the, where the river is when, when you're there. Okay? You need to be able to get your group 10 to 20 vertical feet higher than where you're camping if the river would rise at night. At night. Okay? Also, no, don't camp on an island. Don't camp with the bluff to your back. And just mainly think about where, what would you do if the river rose? All right. Um, one thing to do if you're sort of planning is you can take the book and look at the contour lines behind the gravel bar and you can know whether you're going to have an escape route easily. So that's all good to know. Do a visual escape do a visual inspection of the escape route before setting up, meaning you don't want to be figuring out where you're going to take your five-year-old grandkids in the middle of the night when lightning's popping and the rain's pouring. You need to know where you're going, okay? Um, camping on gravel bars reduces ticks and bug problems. This is the other thing that's awesome about gravel bars. You can literally float 135 miles of river and never go in the woods. Okay, like, and if you walk in the woods, this is how ticks get on you, in case you didn't know. When you brush up against, they, they like to be along trails because animals come by and brush up against the branches and then they jump on the animal. Well, if you're brushing by a bush, they're going to jump on you, or they could. So we do it, we don't even go in the woods. Like we'll use the bathroom on the, we're gonna talk about going to the bathroom in a minute too. Uh, we'll do all that on the gravel bar without really ever going in the woods. Now there are people who camp in the woods. They'll use hammocks and they'll do all kinds of other stuff and, they, and it works for them. So there are, you can do it. I'm just saying what we do is we do, we stay out of the woods and usually come out with zero ticks. Ticks are a problem in Arkansas, in case you haven't heard. <laughs> Um, 
during the summer, consider the afternoon shade. Okay, now if this is like next level camping, is to camp on a gravel bar that's gonna get early shade. Early shade and early sun in the morning. That's, that's like next level planning if you can do that. Okay, so that's camping idea, uh, things to think about. Any questions on anything on this sheet? What has been the, uh, just, just some more general information about how to protect from the ticks other than just staying out of the woods and searching them? And uh, there, there's there's probably websites, but uh, I will say, like, we sell this stuff. What, what do you call it? Yeah, permethrin. Uh, we sell it in a bottle. And you can, if, you, if you wash, soak your pants and your socks in, in permethrin, you're, you're not likely to get any ticks on you. The day before, you, you, do, you take all your gear or not around cats because they're pretty big cats. You take all your gear, stuff you want to get protected, and you soak it the day before. You let it dry. Don't do it right before the trip because it won't work. It's got to be soaked and then dried. And then you're, and it's good for a couple of washings of gear. Oh, Permethrin. cool. So, yeah, and I will say, like, if you do hikes, like, up to um, the NARS, there's no way to avoid brushing against bushes. You're going to. So it might be nice to have a pair of hiking pants that you've put permethrin on. You could spray bug spray on, you know, it's, and you can do tick inspection at night. If you know that you've hiked in the woods, just check yourself and yank them off if you, if they're, if you have one. Any other questions? When she said, but you hiked the whole trail, right? And you did it really fast, right? Oh, that was the wash out. Okay. So you were really hiking like this. Is, okay. Well, I'll, I'm just going to say ticks are a problem, but you can float the Buffalo River. I'll say it again. You can float the entire Buffalo River and never go in the woods. And there are no ticks on the gravel bars. No, I shouldn't say that. Sometimes they are crawling around on the gravel bar, but it's very rare. So, you know, you don't, this doesn't have to be a thing where you're worried about ticks. Okay, any other questions about any of this? Okay, and we can come back. All right, let's talk about the gauge. So there's several, there's a, there's a couple of gauges on the river. The one that we use mostly is the St. Joe gauge. And if you do, if you Google, if you Google Buffalo River Gauge St. Joe, you'll find it easily. Um, so let's look at what's going on here. The river is at 10 feet right here. I think at 11, I think the rental places on the river will stop putting people in at 11, okay? Or if they think it's gonna hit 11. Like if it was here, they're probably not putting you on the river because they know it's going to 11. Okay, so like this is the river, the river on a falling, that's, that's like your ideal scenario right here. Okay, so what, this ha what happens is you plan your trip. Okay, we're going to do Carver to Highway 14, and we're going to do it May 15th through the 20th. Okay, when you, when you get a week out, you look at the gauge, and you're like, okay, it looks good. And you, then you look at your weather, your long-term weather. And as you get closer, you're looking at your weather. <coughs> now, when you look at your weather, weather underground, like I look up Gilbert, weather underground Gilbert. That way you're really looking at the weather, not just Arkansas weather, Gilbert weather. And then I will look at that and I'll see, like if the river's been rising and there's more rain coming, Okay, well, we, we might get flooded out. We might need to push back the dates, okay? Or if, if, I'm supposed to, if we're supposed to put in on the 19th, and obviously the only part of this graph that we have is here. The rest of this doesn't exist yet. Say we're putting in on the 19th, and I'm looking at this. I'm like, okay, we're already at 12 feet. We're not putting on the river right now. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go camp at Petty Jean State Park for a couple days and we're going to keep track of what's going on in the river and we might put in 
on the 20th. So like for me, I would go, I would definitely go put in on the 20th. Like if I looked at this and it had got, gone up and it was on the way down and it was at 11 and a half feet and it was on the way down steeply and my long-term weather forecast was clear, I would be putting in on the river. That's a judgment call for you. I don't think the river gets hard enough, harder necessarily or more dangerous when the water is high, but these spots where the water turns fat in a, in a turn get pushier. Okay, so there's spots where you have to be more aware. Like you need to be seeing it coming and not be in the middle of it when you realize it's happening. Does that make sense? Okay, so a high river isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you need to know that it's on the drop and you have clear, clear weather ahead. Okay, so that's part of floating the buffalo and it's a, it's a natural free flowing river, which means it can flood. But, you know, so just know that as you approach the date, you can also work, you know, lean on the guys doing your shuttle you know, call him, call Gilbert and say, hey, what's up? What do you think? You think it's going to peak? Where do you all think it's going to crest? They're so used to looking at this stuff. They can be a very big asset to you if you're not sure what's going to happen, where it's going to crest out, what day you might be able to put on, when will it be dropping below 11 feet so they'll rent you a boat, that kind of thing. Um. I would just go lower river. There's seven feet is great. Okay. Actually, you could go, this, this isn't even showing five, four, three, but it, it could be much lower than that. Um, but, you know, like we, last year, I can't remember what the river was at St. Joe, but I think it might've been at two or three. And uh, that would be, and in fact, I think I might have a slide on this. Boom, thank you. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so, um, this is this is your this is in the book but your this is what they're saying is ample for floating experienced floaters only over flood stage river close depending on the and i think this is old yeah no saint joe gauge right here so you know if you're looking at low but floatable 3.6 to 4.5 Ample, four and a half to eight and a half. Take it from there. Now, question, you, river close, that's just a period of time when the outfitters won't put you in the water. So Correct. If you're on the water, you're at your own risk. 100%. You're growing up water. Yeah, and if you have your own boat and you're doing your own shuttle, yeah. you can get on the river. Anytime. I'm not saying you should, but you can. There, there's no one that's going to be there saying, no, you can't put it in the river. You can do it, but uh, you know that's that's that would be your choice. But if you're renting or doing shuttles, you probably will not be able to do that. Okay. In, any questions on that? Uh, I think the t the big takeaways are if you're floating the upper, in other words, use the correct gauge for the section of river that you're on, and compare it to this chart and work with your outfitter who's doing your shuttle to get a better idea if it's going up and you're trying to figure out when you could put on, you know, talk to, talk to somebody who knows. Okay, I uh, was gonna get into this and show you a little bit more visually the, what the Buffalo River, any, uh, what the main problem is. <clears throat> All right, so, the flow of the river, when it's coming this way, it, t it'll want, it wants to push into this bank, okay? That's how it creates a bluff on that side. And that's also how a gravel bar is created. So if the water is pushing here, what can happen along here? Flood. Flood, no, but what else can happen? Yeah. Yeah. What's that? could get pushed up again a rock a, a rock could fall in the river because it gets undercut right and fall in the river what else could happen strainers. strainers who said strainers okay 
That's the biggie, okay? A tree is growing on this bank. The water pushes up against the bank, undercuts the tree, the tree falls in. There's water, water flowing through branches is what we call a strainer, okay? Strainers are the m number one thing that you want to be very aware of and careful of on the Buffalo River. And this is what I was talking about where I said high water on the Buffalo is not a problem except for areas like this. Then this is still not a problem if you're aware of it, but if you're, it's pushier. High water is pushier. It's pushing faster and harder into this, a, this, this side. So when we're approaching something like this, we're staying over here and we're sneaking around right here. We're not in the middle. We're, we're not in the middle just floating along looking at the birds or whatever. We're looking at this gravel bar. We're looking at the water going into this bin. We know the water's bending and we're staying close inside right here. And there's a couple of techniques to do this as well. Same thing here, but it isn't as extreme. So you may not have as many things fall in the river, but the biggest thing is to make sure that your group, especially your trip, your trip leader has to be very aware Here's how we do it. We have somebody that's the front boat and somebody that's the rear boat and everyone in the middle can be wherever they want. And we try to keep everyone close enough together to uh, be able to see what the boat in front of you is doing without crowding them, okay? So if the first boat is paying attention and they're sneaking in on the inside of the bend right here and the next boat follows them and the next boat follows them and everybody's good. If the first boat's not really thinking and not paying attention, they get weighted outside and then they hurry up and get to the inside because they have the skills, the person behind them may not have the same skill level and may end up in the outside. Okay, so these are the things that we want to talk about with our group is to make sure that, okay, we're not too spread out because then everybody's like a trip, you know, boat one where you're just trying to figure out where to go. Not, and not too close together because too close together like if we were the lead boat and we weren't paying attention and we ended up out here and then we cut in we would be cutting in and we would be pointing inside that's the other thing that you want to have a good communication with your group is you point where you want people to go you don't point at obstacles okay so you tell you, me why <laughs> okay yeah you, you, you understand that so when you the communication in the group if we cut inside and we're pointing like this that means we want the next boat to go this way okay we're not going to be pointing at that ugly scary strainer over there okay we're pointing where we want the group to go all right so got that okay All right, this, this slide here, the boat, the water is going this way. There's a strainer in the water. The water is pushing, wants to push you out here. Okay, so we're just staying inside and that's perfect. But this is what happens to a lot of people. Okay, here's another way to do it. It's called a, um, a back ferry. Are y'all aware of how a ferry works? A ferry back boat? Freight. The back ferry is a lot harder than the front ferry. Yeah, but it, yeah. yeah, but it works. Yeah. So, and you can keep your eyes on what, where you're headed. So I'm not saying to do this. I'm saying on the Buffalo, you don't have to do this. On harder whitewater rivers, you have to learn to back ferry. What that means is if you set your stern toward this shore and you back, you paddle backwards, the force of the water will slide you across to the inside of the turn. You gotta hold the right angle though. You gotta hold the right angle. It's technical. Almost didn't put this in because I really think the biggest thing with the buffalo is to pay attention and don't get here before you start making a correction. If you start here, you can get through pretty much anything on the buffalo without having to do this technical whitewater technique. But if you want to get next level, 
you could look up back ferrying and do some research and practice and see if you can do it. Okay. I want to ask this, but if you get stuck in that situation, one of your boats is stuck in that situation, mm -hmm. well, what's the protocol at that point? Assuming the people have come out the other side, <laughs> is that what you mean? Yeah, if the other boats, you have well, you're three boats, the other two have battled through correctly, but one got stuck in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so here's the thing. If here's here's what I'm going to say with that. Number one, care. I didn't bring it, but I should have brought it. There's a thing called a throw bag. Okay, and that is a, a it's a long piece of rope that's in a bag, and you can throw it. Okay, so you should have some ropes on the trip to help to try to get a boat off. Okay, there's so many scenarios on how that boat could be stuck on that tree that uh, it's almost impossible for me to say what you should do. But number one is don't make things worse. <laughs> you know, like you may end up having to leave the boat. I've seen boats stuck on rocks. I've seen boats stuck on trees. The, even the Forest Service can't get them off with a motorboat, you know, sometimes until the water drops low enough. The force of water is unbelievable, and it, it's so strong you can't get it off. So let's talk about the ne next thing, too. Uh, do you tie in your stuff or do you not tie in your stuff? Okay. So what, what we do is uh, we tie in everything that's small or sinks. And we don't tie in bigger stuff that floats. So if we have a big dry box or a big dry bag, we just don't tie it in. That way we can, that can just float out and we'll pick it up down the river. And the little stuff is tied to the boat. And then it's easier to get it out. So uh, I, I'm not going to give you a lot of instruction on how to get that boat off that tree. There's just too many scenarios, but you will not get it off unless you have some ropes and some people. Um, so if you're floating sideways into an obstacle, you actually want to be right before it goes into the track. You want to lean, lean in towards the obstacle a little bit because when you lean away from the obstacle, there's like a little weight towards the obstacle. Right. So it makes you throw it up. So, but if, if if you end up in the water floating towards the stringer, at the last minute you want to try to kick your legs and use your hands to try to get up on the stringer as high as you can. Yeah, yeah, that's all you can do. So, here's the thing: pay attention, stay on the inside of the bin. <laughs> and it isn't that bad, honestly. The uh, Forest Service does a good job of working on keeping bad strainers. They'll go through and they'll take them out. So uh, they so it but there can be strainers and we've seen them and uh, not had any bad experiences but it can happen. Okay, if you want to take a picture of this, you can. But I think it might be on one of your sheets. Um, I haven't really used all these people, but they've been around a long time. I think uh, the the buff the the national park ha controls who can do. You know they have rules and these these outfitters are pretty good they know what they're doing okay uh, I'm not going to talk about this whole gear list this is not a gear seminar but I wanted to bring a few pieces of gear that I think apply to the Buffalo specifically uh, that, that I think you should think about what what's that yeah yeah well, that especially during winter. So, a um, couple of things in no particular order. Chairs. Okay, you're going to relax. Having a nice chair is a nice thing. A good fold-up small chair is a really nice thing. When we pack it in the boat, we're packing it up where we can get it off for lunch. You're going to use the heck out of a good, a good folding chair. Steaks, whatever state steaks that come with tents, even the tents we sell are no match for those Buffalo River uh, gravel bars. You really need these old school Walmart nails, <laughs> okay? Um, and if you're setting up a big tarp, I will tell you that there's one trick to it. And it took me years to learn this and I'll try to explain it. 
Okay, imagine this is, this is the ground and you, you put your stake in like this, right? And our tarps that way. Okay, now think about doing this. Take a shovel and dig a hole about this deep. And then dig a trench that your rope can go through toward the tarp and nail your stake to the bottom of the hole and fill the hole back in and the trench. Okay, you want to talk about a strong stake? That's how you do it. Just keep it in mind, especially on the ends, the two stakes that hold up the ends of the tarp. Really, really good trick. Now, where can we get that? Walmart, Walmart. Academy, Walmart. any kind of like, you know, yeah. Yeah, make a. So, um, water. We we have been bringing like a five gallon thing of water, but on a long trip you'll run out. But gravity filter is a really nice thing to have on the buffalo. Um, so instead of like a little tiny backpacking filter, you can get a gravity filter that you can fill this bucket. When you get to camp, you fill the bucket up, you hang it on a tree. This is an old school one. They don't even sell these anymore, so I hate to show it, but I'll show it. The, uh, and the way it works, we'll do this at lunch and at supper. This way you don't have to carry a ton of water. You fill up the bag, you hang it on the tree, and this clips it off. So when you got to get a siphon started, so you suck on the end of the tube and water starts coming out and you clip it off and people can just come fill up their water bottles. Okay, so gravity filter is a really nice thing to have on the river. Um, is that a filter in the bag? Yeah, there's a filter in the bag. But this is, this is those old, that old school paper filter, which I'm on my last one. After this one, I have to get a, a new one. There, but now we have them from Sawyer, we have them from MS, MSR that are the newer technology and better, but work the same way. But you can see the filter in there. Okay, so. So putting the filter actually affects how long you can take it on the canoe. Oh yeah, you gotta do that. <laughs> and the grail is a good cup. And yeah, the grail, grail filter is awesome for the day especially. Um, one of the things with all the technology, I hate to say it, but uh, uh, this is a handy thing to have. Okay, a little, uh, a little solar panel. Uh, you'd be surprised. And, and uh, the only thing we do with our phone is take pictures, but that, that your phone will last about two days, two to three days on air, airplane mode. So on a six-day trip, you're going to have to fill up. Now, you could just bring a battery, a big battery to recharge. But if you have a group, this is pretty nice. Um, if you're doing the upper section and the water is ample, ample water for floating, as they call it, you'll probably be bailing your boat out some. So make yourself a bailer. I like to bring an old school mesh bag. So anything that's going in the boat for the day that I don't want floating loose if I flip over, I put in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a bag like this and tie it to a thwart. This is very, very handy for a day bag. Uh, two burner stove, we cook good food. I like to bring good food and we bring a two burner stove. Dry bags, I really like this with the straps on it. That way I, don't I can carry a lot of stuff and not have to make five trips back to the boat to get my, my stuff in camp. Um, I started doing this. This is a, just a non-waterproof bag. So in this, inside this bag, this is our group tarp. This is my tent. Okay, so you know how your tent comes in a tent bag? Take the tent bag and throw it away and get a waterproof, get a waterproof bag and put it in a waterproof bag. Uh, it packs better, works better, it's easier. Um, so we put that in a waterproof bag. 
I have a trash bag in here for lunch. And um, I have the poles for the tarp in here. And on certain trips, not the buffalo, but this is a really nice thing called a, um, I don't know what it's called, a sand mat, but it's like a mesh, a mesh. If you're camping on sand, it's really nice. Out west, we use it a lot. So here's what I do. Instead of the tent being in with my clothes in, that big, in my big gear bag, I have the tent and the tarp in a bag that's accessible. If we get to camp and it's raining, the first thing that I do is, is get the tarp out and put the tarp up. Then everybody can get out of the rain, wait for it to quit raining, then we can set up camp. And then the tent, keeping the tent out of my clothes bag is a good thing. And it works great when you have it in a waterproof bag like this. Okay. Last thing. Last two things. A box, oh, three things. I don't know if any of you older guys have noticed this, but as you get older, your, bo your butt gets bonier, <laughs> okay? And this little thing we sell for uh, people kayak fishing because they sit on their butt for like nine hours straight. Uh, you talk about nice in a On the buffalo, this is a lifesaver for me. The other thing is we use waterproof box for kitchen and food stuff. There is, this I think is a 40 year old box. <laughs> um, but there, uh, MSR, they don't make this anymore, but MSR is making one that's really nice, not quite as big, which is actually good. Lastly, fly rod. I had it in my car for the class today, so I thought I'd bring it in. Fly rod and all your stuff for fly fishing, and you're ready to go. So that's your that's your camping gear. Any questions on gear? What about the rock? You said you put stuff on gravel. I need more confident on that. Oh, the pad. I didn't bring a pad, but uh, we like to use. We like those inflatable pads now. Yeah. You know, like um, but insulated, depending on the weather. But insulated backpacking pad that's like two two to three inches thick. Those are awesome. Yes. How would you recommend packing your canoe with your gear? What I certain things that you do to certain locations. Or? Well, that's a great question, and I'll th there. There's a lot of variability in there, but let me just say this: when we close that green bag, it's closed till we get all the way to camp. Okay. So, in other words, and I should have brought this. We have a concept we call the day bag. Okay, the day bag has rain gear. If it's cold, it has a hat and a pair of gloves. So, and it has a rain gear bottom. Okay, so at least rain gear in a summer situation is in the day bag. Our lunch, maybe, and um, maybe that's probably mainly it. And also like a lightweight, like a minor. Uh, first aid kit, which to me equals Advil, <laughs> okay? So Advil, uh, rain gear, maybe in cold weather, sweater, hat, gloves. And when this is closed up, it's closed for the day. Now, where you put your stuff, it depends on the size of the canoe and whether you got a cooler and how big your box is. But the biggest thing you wanna make sure you do, when you pack up, try to pack up to where you don't have to undo anything until you get to camp, except for your day bag. Do you put your, all of this in multiple canoes? Because it seems like a lot to have in one canoe. With oh, no, we can have all this in one canoe. Just two canoes? Yeah. Oh, and a cooler. Wow. Two gear in it? We have a 17-foot canoe. That's why a good, a good long canoe is a good thing. Somebody ought to buy that 17-foot Penobscot we have on the front. Because that I'm not just trying to hog it, but that's, that boat, that is, that's what Becky and I have. We had one for 25 years. Which one is that? The Old Town Penobscot. We had one for 25 years and finally was so worn out we gave it to a friend and we have a new one now that's like three or four years old. But uh, that is a great Buffalo River boat. What do you do with your trash along the river? Do you 
That's a great question. So here's, here's, a, here's the answer to that. Number one, instead of trash bags, bring trash compactor bags. Okay? They are so much tougher. You won't get holes in them, you know, coffee, ground juice leaking out into your boat and all that stuff. So trash compactor bag. Number two, all the little spots along the river like Gilbert, Buffalo Point, uh, every uh, Kyle's Landing, so, I don't know, there's a bunch of places where you can put in the river and they'll have trash cans so you can go and dump your trash. Every couple days you can get rid of a trash bag. But that trash compactor bag, that's a good find. Yes? Oh, I'm glad you said that. How do you go in? <laughs> that's a great question. Okay, here's, here's we have a, tr a bag that's a bathroom bag. The bathroom bag is a, a regular pull string, you know, bag. Inside of there is two Ziplocs, one with clean toilet paper and one that's empty. And also there is some hand sanitizer in there, okay? and maybe maybe a shovel but we'd use a stick we don't bring a little shovel so you just walk up the gravel bar till you get out of sight behind a tree or something you dig a hole and you 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 do your business you clean up the dirty toilet paper goes in the empty ziploc bag and you shut it and you put it in your bathroom bag and your so you have your you have your toilet paper bag you have your dirty toilet paper bag and then you do not leave your waste paper in the woods. Is there a special bag for that? No. Just a just a they oh. actually have these these odorless and just it's like a zip lock. Mm -hmm. And they're a little pricey, they're like maybe seven eight dollars each. But they put it in the stir fry and you can have a heating bag that will seal it. And no odor gets that out. That's a great idea. An old coffee bag is a great idea for that's and that's a great idea, idea also. Yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> you could burn toilet paper if you want. <laughs> it's a little iffy. It's a little, some people don't appreciate it. Do it while they're not looking. The uh, so no that. But the big the big point is don't leave toilet paper even buried, because animals will dig that up sometimes and then toilet paper is blown around and it's not it's not cool. Yeah, and toilet paper does not degrade as fast as you think. So it sounds like tumping over your canoe is a distinct possibility. It could happen. <coughs> it's not. I mean, okay. I mean, we. I haven't. It's <laughs> not. It doesn't happen. It, it, we didn't have no canoes flip last year. We almost never have a canoe flip. Okay. It's not. It's not normal. I mean, it happens, but it. It's not so happening the only thing often. You can do is just float until you get in a position where you can upright it. And get yeah. Back. It's not that big a deal. Okay, paddle boarding this river. It would with other people bringing your gear for you, yes. And I don't know, you might end up getting tired. I, you know, can, would you want to paddle board 15 miles? No, not all of it, but like, but like just bring it for fun? I think it'd be pretty fun. Okay. Especially into the wind. Well, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you have, if there's a canoe you can jump in and they tow your board, that's great. I think that would be fun. And you'd have a lot of fun with it on the riffles and riding down. I could see kids having a blast with that. Yeah. Yes. Building a fire for a year. Uh huh. Um, you don't. I guess if you want some, you take it in your canoe with you. So building a fire. Here's here's a couple of thoughts. Yeah. Number one, when you get to your campsite, try to only build fires where other fires have already been built. That's number one. Number two. Um, one of the things we've started doing is when we know we're within a couple of miles of camp, we'll we start looking, there's places on the river where the river's pushed like driftwood up. So we'll look for places where we can go pull some firewood and put it on the boat. That way we don't have to go find it in camp. And uh, that's, you know, other than that, it's pretty, has pretty. Has there ever been a burn ban? Mm, I'm sure there has, but I have, we haven't been there during a burn ban. Okay, let me see. I think I still have more to go. Oh, good. Good timing. <laughs> Man, y'all are ahead of me. Uh, but there's, of course, there's no cell service most of the river. If you have an emergency situation, what, what do you, what could you do? Okay, so 
he asked if if there's no cell service and you have an emergency situation, what should you do? So here's here's a group concept. One boat by themselves, emergency situation, you're stuck until someone comes along. So that's why it's better of a big group. So if you have two boats, one boat's got the emergency, the next boat goes for help. If you have three boats, the best thing is you have one boat where you have your emergency situation, they can't move. It's better for two boats to go for help in case one of, one of those gets in trouble. Four boats, now you leave two and two go for help. So more, more boats gives you a higher level of safety. So you basically have to go for help unless you have one of these little devices where you press the SOS button. But just know when you press that button, they're coming. <laughs> okay? And like, and it's not free. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it might be on the Buffalo because they're going to come in John boats. So the park service will probably come in John boat. But like on the Grand Canyon, they're going to probably fly a helicopter and you might end up owing $20,000. So uh, keep that in mind. So, yeah. Luckily, not a lot of things end up happening, but it could. It could. That's part of part of it, though, is figuring your way out. When you say bring your own boat, John, um, there are literally uh, some people have own their own boat and drive it up there, even from like Louisiana. We won't, so uh, we, we rent our boat through a shuttle service. Correct. Okay. Yeah, you would rent the boat, and they would give you the shuttle all as one package deal. Okay. And that's, I think it saves you a little money off your shuttle, too. Yeah. So, but... But, you know, if, but the boats are not inexpensive to rent. I think they're like $80 a day or $100. They're a lot. So <clears throat> you can judge it. If you have your own boat, you can look and see how much it is to rent with a shuttle or how much it's just going to cost you to bring your own with a shuttle and decide on that. Question. Um, going in seasons, do, do we ever, do you all ever just get a big group so you don't have to do shuttles? Mm -hmm. so no. Many boats leave here and meet up. And nope, we don't. Like that. We don't. Um, I don't know anybody here from the paddle club. Paddle yeah. club. I haven't seen the paddle club do it, so I, I I'm going to say there. No, there isn't. Mm -hmm. In the past, we used to guide a trip on this, and Becky and I have guided uh, trips on the Buffalo before, but we just decided because of the uncertainty of the water levels. You know, and just in the general difficulty of it, we just haven't done it in a, a few years. And now on the website, are we able to send out messages to get in touch? Is it like Facebook? I hadn't been, I mean, I have it on my on Facebook. I follow it, but is there like a partner list or a group list where you can access? For, for other people that might yeah. want to go paddle? No, but that's a good idea. But uh, <laughs> the best thing, are you from Lafayette? Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge? Okay, so there's the Louisiana Hiking Club, which also includes a lot of paddlers. Mm -hmm. There's the Bayou Hay Stackers, which is a pretty active uh, paddle club. And there's the Lafayette Paddle Club, which are all like just public clubs that get together and go on trips and stuff. Mm -hmm. So those, those are the best ways to connect with other people in general. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Have you ever seen an exploding asteroid? That's a great question. I have. I will say that uh, snakes freak me out, <laughs> and I'm always on the watch for them, and we don't see that many. The, the, by far the most common snake on the buffalo is a, is a water snake, and they are non-venomous, but I still don't like them. <laughs> uh, we've been, you see some bird life. We've been seeing a lot of bald eagles lately. The last few years, there's been more and more bald eagles that we see. So we've been seeing them a lot. You'll see deer on the upper section. There's an area where they have elk. Um, there is, and bi they might have bison up there too that the park is raising because I think there used to be, they're just, I don't, I don't say they're reintroducing them, but um, you'll see uh, sometimes, I don't really see them as often, but you hear them. Uh, the beavers at, at night slapping their tail. Uh, you'll you'll have a 
in the spring and early summer, you'll have a lot of fireflies, which you don't see a lot of fireflies around here <coughs> anymore, but you'll see them. You'll see some otters that'll come in, you know, slide down the bank into the water. Um, and, you know, that, that's, that's probably the most of it. Wolves. No wolves. No wolves. No. Nope. I don't, I, I'm sure there are bears there, but they're so, I, I think the population such that you're probably not going to see a bear. Yes. Jim's Bluff, have you stayed? I don't know where that is. I, we could try to look it up on okay. in here. Do you know what, if it's on what section? I just told a person that uh, at the park that I would go about halfway from Pocket or Pruitt, and she said, okay, well, Jim's Bluff's about halfway. That might okay, be we can look. When, after this, come up and we'll look okay. it up in the book. <coughs> um, a weapon um, gun, is that needed, necessary, or obviously, maybe not, or obviously not? I've never brought one, but I, you know, I'm sure people do. I don't know what the rules are with the national park. I would look that up, but uh, I don't. I don't think it is. We don't. But uh, but you could look it up. And I know a lot of people just feel safer and like to do that. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So if you want to do it, the only thing I would say is just look up the national park and see if they have any rules about it. Footwear. Oh, that's a good question. Footwear. Um, I, you know, we've always worn like Chaco type sandals, which I like, and I usually bring Chaco sandals. And uh, I've started bringing river shoes, which are mesh, and they keep, you know, how rocks get under your feet with sandals. You know, I've started bringing river shoes, which is a little bit better for the rock under your foot problem. Also, be sure to bring some a set of dry shoes and socks that you put on because that is so nice in the evening on the gravel bar after you're done in the river. Yeah. You put on some nice dry socks and shoes and that's nice to have. Thank you and a half. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, what time of the year is the river warm enough to swim in? That's a good question. What time of year is the river warm enough to swim? I would say probably May. Okay, really? Even in May. Uh, you know, April trips, we don't swim a lot, yeah. May trips, and definitely June definitely. trips. And another thing about time of year, I love the spring, but sometimes it can be cold, but there's not that many people in April and May, but that to me is some, almost some of the best time to go. Uh, the river does get low in the summer, so you got after June, you got to be looking at it because it can get too low. too low probably but you know if they've had rain it it could be totally fine okay okay any other questions all right how many so how many people think they might do it now after hearing this yay thank you <laughs> made me feel good uh good so uh i will say this if you um if you're planning your trip and you have a question, you can email me. And I'm going to give you my email. It's john, J-O-H-N, at packpaddle.com. And, uh, and I'll try to help you if I can. If, you have a, if you're planning a John, John. John, J-O-H-N, at packpaddle.com. Pack yeah. And if you have a question about, you know, what should I do about whatever you know the river's low where should i go i can try to help you out assuming you know i'm in town or something what's your last name john williams, williams. Mm -hmm. um will amazon have that book or i they might they might they might okay yeah we're really low. So when you go out, if you don't, if you don't mind, put your name and phone number on there. If you want to get one of these, you're not committing to it, but you know, when you when we get them in, we'll call you. And um, okay, any questions? Any more questions? All good. All right. Thank you all for coming. We enjoyed it.